Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for our webcast on pricing strategies for federal government contracting. Um, this morning or this afternoon, depending on when you're tuning in, we are going to cover some specific strategies um, for pricing your proposal the most effectively. And I'm going to now introduce um, today's experts to cover these topics. Next slide. Jenny Clark is the CEO of Solvability and works exclusively with small businesses in federal contracting on accounting systems, indirect rate strategies, and offers DCAA compliant QuickBooks boot camps, plus software evaluations and support for Dell Tech GCS Premier, Dell Tech First Essentials, Dell Tech Cost Point, and Jamis, among others. We appreciate Jenny's insights today as she brings many years of expertise and background to our strategies. Kirsten Dodson is a CPA and CFO for CFO Strategic Partners. She has 20 years of experience in accounting and financing and began her career at Ernst & Young LLP. She specializes also with DCAA government contractors across the spectrum from engineering to manufacturing and has over 14 years experience at, formally as the senior audit manager for Keith Altizer and Company. In that role, she provided financial statement assurance to small to medium-sized businesses and was able to work closely with business owners to resolve financial issues that were facing them, often providing roadblocks to achieve their goals. So we appreciate these ladies taking the time today to go a little bit more in depth on how we can be more effective in our proposal pricing. Jenny, with that, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, well thanks so much for the introduction, Leslie, and thanks for putting all this together for us. It's been a great uh, collaboration. So as far as what we're going to talk about today, um, we're going to talk about pricing strategies. Before I do that, I wanted to talk to you guys about what we're trying to help you with. We've, uh, both Kirsten and Jenny and Leslie, we've all worked for government contractors in this environment. And so what we want to do is help you guys with the roadmap. Um, so I, I don't know if you see what I've got here, but if you take a look at it, does anybody know what that is? That is the Washington Metro. Several years ago, I went up to Washington. I was there for a conference, and um, I was staying in a hotel. We were supposed to get over to another part of Washington, D.C., and so I thought, well, this will be easy. I shouldn't really have a problem. I went downstairs and said, do I just need to take a taxi? And he said, no, no, just take the Metro. So I walked outside the hotel. He had pointed down the street. I headed down the street. It was July. I was wearing the ideal course. I wandered around, and I didn't see what I was used to seeing, like a giant metro sign or anything like that, but I did see a lot of people heading into a parking garage. So I decided maybe that's the metro. If not, it'll get me somewhere. So I followed them down, and voila, I was at the metro. So the next thing I had to worry about is, oh gosh, it looks like I have to buy a ticket. I don't know how much ticket I need or which direction, or it looks like they have a lot of buttons here. But luckily, they had an all-day pass. So I went ahead and got my metro, and I went downstairs. The next part wasn't too bad. I went down the stairs. I could see, okay, I've either got to be on the left side or the right side. If I'm on the wrong side, I'll switch sides. That's no big deal. Figured that part out, got on the little train, and, um, you know, I, I saw the little lines for greens and blues and yellows to figure out which ones I needed to take and where I needed to switch. That wasn't too bad. But when I got up out to the end and I was at the final station, the next question I had to figure out was, which exit do I take? Because they were marked, obviously, but I didn't know where I was, so I wasn't sure which one did, that I needed to take. So I exited up there, and as one would expect, it was the wrong exit, and I ended up having to walk about four blocks to get around where I needed to. So really our goal today is to talk to you about, we want to help you figure out uh, the things that you don't know. If you know how to get on and off, if you know what to what ticket to buy, if you know what exit to take, great. But we also want to answer questions for you like, okay, do you need speed or do you need safety? Um, which ways do you want to go? Because there's always several different ways to get there. And so we want to be your guides with that. 
So let's talk real quickly about pricing strategies. So you can see I've got a bunch of stuff on this screen. So I want to go over kind of the typical ways that people come up with their cost and pricing strategies and then give you some insight into how we think you might want to narrow it down for yourself. Probably the number one way that people figure out their pricing strategy is they do a cost buildup. Of course, you've all done that, where the first thing you do is you go to the program manager, whoever's bidding the job, and say, hey, Bill, tell me who's going to work at how many hours, what labor categories, things like that. You'll also find out uh, specifically how you want to uh, respond to the bid and put people in what uh, groupings, how you want to average their rates and things like that. But then typically you apply a percentage for fringe, a percentage for overhead, a percentage for G&A, and a percentage for profit or fee. So that's the cost buildup method. That's what most people use, just rates times hours and then put on your burdens and profit. The next one is reverse engineering, and that's one of those things where you pretty much have an idea from the program manager. You said, I think that what we're supposed to bid is X. And so you reverse engineer it to say, um, here's how many hours that would represent, or here's how much I need to get the job done. And it's almost like you take the price and work backwards to come up with some rates that you can use. And again, you're going to go back to those individual elements. What are my overhead, fringe, G&A, profit rates that I have to do? How many hours of what kind of people, what do I have to pay them, and come up with it that way? The more common thing we've been seeing lately, unfortunately, is called LPTA, Lowest Price Technically Acceptable. So with LPTA, what we're finding is companies are having to figure out what they think the market will bid and try to back into some way to do that. Um, we're having to cut what our pricing is. Um, usually you have to pay the people that you're going to have on the job the rates they're expecting to do. You can't keep cutting people's salaries. What it does mean is you're going to have to be skinnier on your fringe plan. You're going to have to have lower overhead. You're going to have to cut your G&A. The main ways that you do that is you take a step back from where you think you are and say, what would it take to win this job? And do I feel like I have to cut my rates in order to do that? And if that's what the boss said we've got to do, then that's, that's how we're going to have to bid it. There's also... Um, on the left-hand side, you can see some other three variations on the same thing. Um, one is where you're a subcontractor to a prime, and they pretty much have figured out what it has to be priced at. And so they say, here are the rates you have to use. We want you to back in it into them. So that's kind of a combination of reverse engineering and LPTA. They figured out what the rates need to be, and you'll take your own employees' pay rates for that and kind of divide that out so you know, okay, this is how much we have to pay them, so this is all we have left to cover our fringe, our overhead, our G&A, and our profit. So you're really backing into it with that way. Up at the top left is uh, a swag, uh, a strategic wild ass guess, and that's when um, you kind of know what you've got to hit, and um, you're really backing into those rates. But to a certain extent, this happens a lot, but you'll end up with a strategic guess where you've got somebody that's very experienced in the field as a program manager, and they pretty much say, based on what I know about this customer and our history and the other bidders and the type of work it is, here's where we've got to hit. And um, they're pretty specific about what they want you to do with that. The last one down at the bottom, I just call it Hail Mary. Um, and you've really been told by somebody, and as an accountant, we don't like to hear this, but this is what they said you have to bid. And it's your job to facilitate what they want to bid. And um, what I usually tend to do with that is um, identify what the numbers are, divide out the pay rates, and say, this is the amount of burden that I have to deal with, and let's go forward with it. Um, you can't continually say, we can't make any money off that, because honestly, it's not quite your call at that point. What you want to do is accommodate your program managers and your executives to do what, you need, what needs to be done, what they're asking you to do. So on the right-hand side, I'm going to cover a little bit more about the agencies, the contract type, and your risks, and your goals. Every company has an approach to the work that they're going after, and they frequently will break it down a little bit further based on the type of work and what we're doing. So on the left-hand side, I've got a list of targets. So you have to consider the agency, and by that I mean is it DOD, is it Army, is it Navy, 
is it NASA? Because they all have different approaches and different prices at pricing points and, and strategies that you run into. Corps of Engineers is totally different. If you go on with a civilian agency like uh, the FAA, it's something else. The size, by that I usually mean the size of the contract. Is it a million dollar contract, a five million dollar contract, or a three year or five year term? Is it 10 million a year? Those kind of things. Um, obviously, when you're bidding on smaller things, you usually feel like you're a lot closer to the numbers and you'll know what you're doing. There's less risk overall. So the size you have to take into account. And then last, the types. As far as the types of targets, we're really talking about um, is it an IDIQ? And so let me go into contract types next. So there's really three or four basic kinds of contracts for government contracts. One's a fixed price where everything's defined. You're really almost, to me, you're filling out a piece of paper and sticking it in an envelope and hoping that the scope you identified, um, that you considered all the parts and you came up with the right pricing. But it's pretty much a fixed price, and in a way, to me, that's a pass-fail. There's not going to be a lot of negotiation. They're just going to be looking at how the you described you would deliver the work in the management volume, and then they'll just look at the, at the price next. The second is T&M, where normally we'll have, here's the labor categories, here's the billing rates, and here's how many hours. So with T&Ms, usually when you're being evaluated, they're really looking at how you responded to your descriptions of the labor categories and what the rates are, billing rates are for the different categories and your overall price. So you see it's a little bit more detailed than the other, um, and you need to have some uh, consideration because you're going to be bidding a certain amount of rate for each year, you have to consider the escalation, you have to consider um, how you'll be compensating your workforce and so forth. IDIQ stands for indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. An IDIQ is really like bidding for a giant purchase order. Sometimes they call these uh, GWACs, government-wide authorization contract or something like that. I'd have to look it up. But anyway, these are big contracts like $50 million, and what you'll see is they're usually three to five, and what you're really doing is bidding rates over a period of time so you can get on a master schedule so that somebody from another agency could order off that master schedule. So an IDIQ, sometimes you don't even get any work on an IDIQ. So a lot of people will say an IDIQ is nothing but a hunting license. A GSA schedule, General Services Administration schedule, frequently is considered an IDIQ. And the last thing is called a cost plus. The reason I put it last is there seem to be trends where there's more cost plus and there's less cost plus. The NASA is an agency that does a lot of cost plus work. Also, the Navy does a lot of cost plus work. And anything that's in the R&D or research and development area is cost plus. What you're really doing there is you're bidding what you expect your fringe overhead G&A rates to be over a period of time, and then there'll be a separate dollar or percentage amount for your uh, fee or profit on that. So it's a different game. You've got to think about it a little bit differently. Then on the right-hand side, you can see that I've got um, the other elements to take into a case, which are your risk. Um, number one is, is this business that's follow-on, that you're expecting to get, that you've always gotten, um, that you have a pretty high probability of being able to stay in the game with? Or is it growth? Is it a new field you're trying to do, a brand new customer, or how you want to do it? What I'll see with a lot of companies, if you're going with for a new customer or a new business area, they tend to be more aggressive on pricing because they're just like, we've got to get in the door with that agency. We've got to be able to get our first contract with them. And so as an accountant, sometimes you'll think, well, but we're not going to make any money off of it. That's not really the point they're going after. They're trying to grow in a new area. Then the last thing down at the bottom is just, is there an R, is it an R&D type thing where you're trying to get in early on some prototype work or something new that's going on? Not much different from growth, but there's a lot going on in the R&D world right now. So, Kirsten, um, I think you're going to talk about the math, the pricing business buildup, and the accounting, right? Right. Yeah, thank you, Jenny. So with whatever strategy or approach that you decide to go with um, based on Jenny's discussion, uh, you'll always want to still have a good handle on what your underlying costs are going to be. So ultimately, with that strategy, you have a good handle on what you're expecting your bottom line profit to be, 
what you expect the impact to be on your cash flow so you can properly manage that and manage your business to ultimately where, where what your goals are. So um, with that, let's look at our pricing buildup where basically we're going to start, the core of it's going to be our direct pay rate. So we have our contract and we have our assigned employees who are going to be directly working on that contract. And this is basically just their labor rate. So that's going to be our, uh, and the <clears throat> bulk of our direct costs. Now, in addition, in our direct costs, we'll have maybe some travel and materials and other direct costs, but the core of it is typically our labor. Um, and then after that, we have our indirect costs, which are typically comprised of our next three bullets, our fringe expenses, our overhead expenses, and our general and administrative expenses. So fringe are typically going to be those costs related to employing your labor force. So, uh, pretty much just about all of your employee benefit costs, everything from payroll taxes to holiday pay, uh, paid time off costs, uh, medical and other types of insurances that you may offer your employees, as well as any retirement plan plans, contributions that you'll make. So all of those will roll, roll into your fringe expense portion of your indirect rates. From there, you'll have your overhead expenses, and those are going to be your costs to support the contract and your direct labor force, but maybe not necessarily directly related to just one one particular contract. So that could inc that's going to include certain overhead labor, um, for example, like meetings with program managers and your direct labor force that might not necessarily fall under your um, statement of work. So those costs, costs of hiring your direct employees would fall into this category typically, as well as you would um, often take uh, other expenses such as rent uh, and allocate a portion of that to your overhead, office expenses, your IT costs, phones, internet, things like that, you'll usually have a portion that ends up being allocated to your overhead expenses as well. And then we'll have uh, our GNA expenses. Those are costs typically uh, to support the company and running the business. So again, you'll have some labor in GNA. And that's typically labor for those people who are managing the business and performing administrative type functions. BNP labor will fall into this category. Uh, legal and accounting professional type fees are usually um, categorized in GNA as well as business insurance. And then uh, similarly, GNA will usually have an allocation of rent and office expenses and those phone IT type costs as well allocated to that. And then on top of that, so that's basically our cost structure, and then on top of that, we'll have our fee. That ultimately rolls up into how we price and build up our, our billable rates. So with that, we'll move on to the next slide and talk about how it all comes into play. Let's move on to the next slide. Thank you. So those costs that we just discussed will roll up into ultimately our billable rate, our wrap rate. So the wrap rate is going to be uh, our direct labor multiplier rate. It's the fully burdened labor rate. And basically the rate at which we want to bill out our direct labor so that we can cover our direct and indirect costs. So as I mentioned, it's really important that we get a good handle on those underlying costs so that we can properly price out and bill our work, or at least have an idea of where we're going to stand if we don't fully cover these costs. So in our example, we start with um, our direct labor rate of $60 per hour. And then on top of that, we work at, we've calculated our fringe rate, so we've looked at those total fringe costs compared to our total labor costs to come up with a fringe rate. And then that will be applied to that base direct labor cost. And then next, we'll have our, our overhead costs, um, where we've looked at those compared to our direct labor and usually our BNP labor base to come up with a rate on that. And that rate <coughs> actually gets applied to both our direct labor and our fringe rate, so it gets compounded. So in this example, we had a 2% overhead rate, but in reality, that 2%, rather than equating to just two cents on every dollar, it's going to equate to about two and a half cents because it does get applied um, to your fringe as well. And then we'll have our GNA rate that we've calculated, and it similarly gets applied to our fringe and overhead rates, that 10% sample rate actually factors out in our example to about 13 cents for every dollar of direct labor that we're going to be 
uh, charging and wanting to recover. And then finally, we'll have our fee that we've uh, negotiated and agreed to, and in this example, it's 5%, and that also does get applied to our entire cost structure, so that 5%, in this example, again, really equates to about $0.07 cents on every dollar of direct labor. So ultimately, for what we're saying here is for every dollar of direct labor, we want to charge 1.5 or $1.50 um, to basically fully recover our costs and get the fee that we're striving for. So in this example, our $60 base labor rate would actually end up being billed out at $90.12 per hour. Okay, so now we can move into the next slide where we see ultimately, you know, from a bigger picture standpoint, from our financial statement standpoint, where does all of this end up? And so this is an example of a typical government contractor income statement. Um, and it is rather condensed and heavily focused on these areas that we've been discussing. So we'll start with our revenue line. So that's basically that billable rate that we've factored in and what it's equated to as far as our revenue. And then we'll have our direct labor cost. So again, that was just our direct contract employees, the cost of that labor. And then we roll into our indirect expense category, our fringe, our overhead, and our G&A. And um, we'll have those costs that we've incurred to ultimately come up with our gross profit on our contract. And then from there, uh, we may have some unallowable some ex excess compensation or unallowable marketing costs or contributions and things like that. So those will be um, sort of below the line, but then ultimately factor into calculating our net profit for the company. And then often, so as I mentioned, this is a pretty condensed income statement, which is what most contractors typically present. And then oftentimes, I know with my clients, we'll have more detailed a statement of indirect expenses where we can look a little closer at those three indirect categories that we just talked about of fringe, overhead, and G&A. So with that, I think I will turn it back over to Leslie to wrap up. Thanks, Kirsten. Nice job. That was very informative. Both you and Jenny really um, helped explain and describe what all those costs are and how the pricing should be structured. So we appreciate you tuning in today to our little presentation from Jenny at Solvability and Kirsten Dodson at CFO Strategic Partners. Their contact information is here on our last slide. Should you have additional questions, um, usually at the end of these presentations, I like to say it's a great time to sort of ask the expert. Um, so these ladies, um, as you can imagine, have a billable rate of their own. So I invite you to take advantage of the opportunity to ask them questions via email um, or their Twitter or LinkedIn information. So thank you again, and enjoy your day. Thanks, Leslie.